<laughs> right, listen, we're going we're to start. I think we should start. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on right now to uh, a special segment, a special segment called EFB Talks. These are slightly different from maybe what, uh, what we're used to. These are basically, we've got eight, uh, eight bright minds, eight people that will be standing on this stage sharing, uh, sharing their ideas, sharing their, their knowledge, their, their insights, helping us all to... to uh, to understand things a little bit more on a, on a deeper scale, perhaps, helping us learn, inspire us, wonder a little bit more, and answer maybe questions that we need answering, but more so the uh, connections that we need as well, and to provoke conversations as well. You'll see what I mean once the, the first couple of speakers start to speak and share their ideas. They have, uh, they have about 12 minutes to share their ideas, really simple, really easy as well, and I'm going to get straight on and present the first speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage a man who's a disruptor. He's a visionary. He's an internationally recognized go-to entrepreneurship ecosystem expert, bridge maker, and investor. Pretty impressive, would you say? Right, there was a... You got... He's done nothing. I've just given him a great intro. I hope you deliver. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the chairman of the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor in Bulgaria, Mr. Iskren. Station. Beautiful hand drawing behind us by Jason Paget is a representation of the number pi. Everything we know and everything we don't know is recorded in the sequence of numbers within it. There is a sequence of what the perfect European Union would look like. There is even me. My body is not who I am. It's where I live. My career is not who I am. It's what I do. I'm a multi-dimensional, amazing, wonderful, complex creature like everybody else. And all my actions, or lack of actions thereafter, have impact and spillover effect similar to the butterfly effect. I'm a physical and intellectual being, but emotional and spiritual creature as well. We cannot be devised by gender, religion, color, job title, disabilities, but only by the size of positive measurable value we bring to ourselves, to others, and to the environment. We are all special. We all have an element we are exceptional in. We consist of bacterial and cell communities which divide, grow, communicate, and develop. Actually, we live on a planet of bacteria. We are biological units with beginning and an end, and in order for our lives to have purpose, we must bring and capture extraordinary value. We must also be clear that we are not the only ones evolving within our environment. Something else is evolving. Actually, even our environments are evolving beyond the three-dimensional concept. 
we suddenly find ourselves existing in a super connected digital world where some of us are much better looking, much smarter online, and way more active than the three dimensional world. Land, sea, air, wars, this is what used to define a state's sovereignty. But now, the cyber world increasingly influences geopolitical dynamics and artificial intelligence is a tool to exert power. We could argue that it's true that Moses was the first person with a tablet downloading data from the cloud. However, we simply cannot prepare for a future only mirroring the past. Disruptive megatrends, individual empowerment, diffusion of power, demographic patterns, and game changers, governance gap, impact of new technologies, connectivity, all of them look for innovative solutions. Let's do a little thought experiment. Let's take three radically disruptive technologies. Cryptocurrencies, Uber, self-driving cars, but with solar panels. What happens when you mash all three of them together? It's a self-owning car. A car that produces its own energy, it pays for its lease and its insurance by giving people rights. A car that is not owned by any corporation, but a car that is the corporation. A car that exists as an aut autonomous legal entity with no human ownership. Well, welcome to the decentralized autonomous corporations and networks. AI has a huge advantage over humans. And it is the best in using the data we produce. The key to be able to use available data to our own advantage is a know-how is the development of necessary skills in an environment, an ecosystem. Data scientists represent less than 1% of total employment within the European Union. And only one in 10 of the EU's SMEs used big data analytics in 2017 due to lack of skills, skilled staff. I'm sure that we may find a bigger challenge on the Balkans with these numbers. All stakeholders in an ecosystem must look for an, and, and interact actively with such available data. Otherwise, we are risking highly wealthy and uh, influential individuals benefiting from AI and creating an enormous gap in society. A gap where they get wealthier smarter and healthier, and others way less educated and profitable. In our parents' life, um, well, they didn't live in a digitalized era. However, we are. Our children already have access to vast amounts of information. AI and deep learning technologies are already transforming their lives. Traditional schools and universities must be retold to fit a much faster developing world in order to, for our children to be able to make the best use of digital super intelligence rather than the other way around. AI cannot wait one more generation. There is an urgency to tackle all changes it possesses. How we treat data impacts an entire ecosystem. This is a representation of an entrepreneurship ecosystem by Dan Eisenberg. If we can use it to scale municipalities, which he's doing in the US, imagine what AI could do with the true sets of data. Let's start with governments. Governments are the best when it comes to scale and institutional capacity. However, they're very slow in response to change. The role of governments in the very near future will be mostly coordinating due to the exponential technological and informational growth. 
we will actually soon not be talking about uh, about big data. We'll be talking about extreme data. The Balkans must be involved in the debate about the future of the European Union. The European Union was con conceptualized as a single market, ruled by four freedoms, movement of people, goods, services, and capital. A fifth freedom, the free flow of data, must not only be discussed, but rapidly implemented if the EU wants to have the edge as a single market. We need to understand the power of data-driven governance and ensure the decentralization of data. This must become a EU fifth freedom. Businesses are more agile, but can easily be motivated by greed. Communities have idealism and human focus, but also could be very dogmatic when driven by single issues. We are increasingly faced with a polycentric governance challenge, where states, markets, businesses and communities all need to become interacting centers of power as we deal with new challenges. To prevent ethics failure, a system of checks and balances needs to be set up. Governance and making business is easy. Integrity is not. Corruption is the biggest threat to a functioning and fair system. If you trade, trace the corruption index uh, geographically from North Europe towards the South, a trend can, can be observed. Countries that are actively opposing corruption demonstrate higher economic growth and sustainability. I believe sustainability is key to growth, but disruption is key to development. What is necessary is to rebuild trust. It's necessary to be open, transparent, and accountable to the people first. True leaders create legacy by creating other leaders. Visionaries empower artists, inventors, and entrepreneurs who shape our world and values. Failing to regain trust is an alternative where we blindly hand over our entire existence to a digital superintelligence supremacy. Everything we want is on the other side of fear. So let's start crossing. True leaders set vision, mission, values, and create and sustain trust. The responsible leaders of tomorrow are people who can benefit from singularity with artificial intelligence, where access to superintelligence must be available to all layers of society. We all have different stories, but common hopes. Here we are to build partnerships because no one attempts the impossible without belief in something greater than themselves, even if that something is a someone. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's getting coached off. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Okay, right, before we move on to the next speaker, on your left or on your right, look to your left, look to your right, you should find a sticker of one or four colors. It may be green, it may be yellow, it may be blue, or it may be red. I think there are four colors. I hope there's four colors. Basically, what you do with that sticker, no questions asked. You take that sticker off. Take it off. Take it off. <laughs> and then stick that sticker. There's only one place to stick that sticker. No, not that place. The other place, which is basically <laughs> on, your, um, on your badge. Okay, stick it on your badge. Bang. I haven't got one here, but if you stick it on your badge. This is a very important sticker. You may, not, you may think this is just, just a sticker. It's not. Because later on, when we finish the EFB talks, we'll be moving on to the very last part of our two days together, which is literally called the speed dating part. Now, do not be afraid, because it's not, please, it's, not, it's professional speed dating. All you have to do is one thing. All you have to do is find somebody else who has the same color sticker 
as you. For example, um, Una, you have the color yellow, that's right. If somebody else has yellow, who has a yellow sticker? Who's got a yellow? You've got a yellow sticker. Now, what you can do, basically, you have to find somebody else with the same sticker and then go to the bar and get a drink together. Okay? Okay? <laughs> Right, you, and it doesn't have to be the same. It could be the same sex. It could be a, a guy, a girl, whatever. It doesn't does not matter at all. But basically, you find somebody with the same colour sticker, go to the bar, and that gives you a drink. No stickers, no drinks. Okay, is that clear? Yes, it is. Right, we <laughs> we move on. So hopefully, you've all got a sticker. Right, let's move on to the next next speaker right now on stage. So the next speaker actually spent the last decade advising governments advising organizations, professionals, institutions, all about well-being and, uh, and behavioral economics as well. And today, he's going to share a little dose of that right on this stage for you right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the independent consultant known very simply as Mr. <laughs> Anjde Pirka. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I'm waiting for the deck. All right, as Peter just introduced me, I've been spending quite a while around the world, out of Brussels, out of Singapore, and currently out of Moscow, Russia, advising people about uh, well-being. Um, my name is uh, Andrzej Perka. Which clicker? My name is Andrzej Perka, and what I, I am German-Polish, the name is very Polish, my growing up was very German. Um, and as I noticed over this work of advising people and organizations about well-being, which means uh, advising them how they can maximize the happiness, the life satisfaction of people, what I mainly noticed is uh, how much of an idiot I was, actually, because I talked about happiness so much, yet I noticed that I wasn't able to create happiness for myself most of the time. I was being, for example, emotionally available, unavailable to my family, my health wasn't doing too well, and I knew what I had to do, but I didn't do it, right? So the next step in my research interest was then to study this kind of irrationality. Why was I taking these wrong decisions despite knowing better? And uh, what I want to do today is talk to you about why I think us as humanity, we might be lost in paradise, meaning that we've created the resources and the skills, and we achieved incredible things in reducing poverty and reducing violence, we could be living in paradise. And what is keeping us from entering paradise is actually ourselves, flaws in our thinking. Um, and actually, a hope of mine, and we just heard a similar point in the talk before me, is that the robots could actually help us get to paradise after all. Let me start by talking about irrationality. So I'm going to talk about two main topics, which is irrationality and well-being, on the other hand. And I believe that the findings and research over the past decades in those two areas have been so explosive, so such showstoppers, that we should be stopping and thinking about how we do education, how we do many things in our society. But we didn't. And I will explain to you why that probably is. So our thinking has not evolved to be precise and suited for the complex world that we live in today. Our thinking has only evolved over the 300,000 years that humans existed to create survival. And because we only needed survival, our thinking is, um, is skewed towards, it feels right when it's cliquish, when we prefer people that are similar to us. It is, has evolved to be lazy. We prefer the quick, easy thought over the complicated one that takes effort. Our thinking has evolved to be selfish, to be short-sighted, and finally, to be, to be averse to risk and to change. And if you look at these five points, this is a very, very radical uh, summary. You know, there have been several hundred of these biases and distortions studied. But if you look at this uh, summary, you can imagine that it helps the prehistoric human to run away from an animal. But it causes problems in today's world and the complexity that we need to address every day. You can see that the root of, for example, racism and nationalism is in there and many other things. And what the problem with this is that things feel right that actually aren't. So very often when we believe that we're being rational, we're actually irrational. This has been shown in many studies and experiments. When we believe we're being impartial, we're actually being partial. And it happens very often that we firmly believe 
we are right when we're actually wrong. The impact this has on a lot of domains of society is that we live in an illusion of competence, that we make ourselves believe that we have a correct judgment, that we do uh, extremely good work, that we're highly competent, why in fact um, the results of our work are not that of competence at all. But we don't have the complexity in thinking to understand this fully. Let me share two numbers with you that I quite like. Um, so, a study has investigated treatments in the first decade of this century, and they, they looked at how many of the treatments actually proved to be correct. And this study found that 40% of medical treatments get reversed, meaning they turn out to be completely wrong. They did nothing. So if you lived in that decade, it's quite likely that around 40-50% of the medical treatments you received were completely useless. How can that happen? Again, back to the cognitive biases, the, the distortions in our thinking. We are flawed in finding out what the perfect treatment is, but we keep doing it because we don't have the complexity in our thinking and the data to actually see that uh, what we did in this medical treatment does, doesn't actually work. Or another number um, about finance, from the world of finance. Where do I have to hold this? Um, so we think of investment bankers as evil sometimes, especially after what they've caused over the past decade. But we think of them as very intelligent, very sharp and very effective in multiplying money, right? And I recently looked at a paper where they investigated how much, how many of investment bankers actually covered their cost, meaning that they produced more money than they cost, that their skill was producing additional profits. And the number of mutual fund managers not covering their costs is 97% according to that paper. So these are pretty dramatic figures and they have an implication in virtually all the societal systems. Uh, we will hear later from uh, Regina Joseph, who worked with uh, Professor Tetlock. You might have heard of his work in studying expert political judgment. And as you can imagine, in fuzzy systems such as policy making, the impact of these thinking flaws is very, very heavy, meaning that um, he found pretty appalling rates of political judgments, political predictions actually becoming true. The other area that I uh, have spent quite some time researching over the past years and decades is the area of well-being. And again, I believe we're looking at an illusion that we were not really made by nature to create happiness for ourselves, but we live in an illusion of what will make us happy. And this is relevant in a context such as this, I believe, because we simply what is the, the end goal of policy making, right? It should be to create the biggest amount of happiness for the biggest possible uh, number of people. But when we look actually at what we believe will make us happy, such things such as wealth, um, youth, you know, um, other aspects, status before others, um, power, or distractions, meaning we feel overworked, stressed, we need distractions. We believe they will make us happy, yet they lead at best to little blips of, of excitement, of pleasure, but in the long term, they don't produce lasting, sustainable happiness. Um, and can even lead to misery because they deplete us over time. On the other hand, what does drive happiness, what has been shown in studies to be really happiness making, things such as 40,000 uh, euros annual household income in Western country. So this is a surprisingly low number. This is, um, so for example, if you, own, if you used to earn 10,000 and then you get to 40,000, you're likely to be much happier. Yet, if you make the next step, anything above that will not make you much happier. Yet, a lot of our societal thinking, societal systems, are, are skewed towards the accumulation of extreme wealth and the imbalances and inequalities that uh, are derived from that. Control over time uh, makes us happy if we perceive that we can control our time. Focus, meaning meditation, mindfulness, all these things are very strong drivers of a sustainable happiness. Um, exercise, sports, giving, volunteer, volunteer work, uh, many of you in this room will know that. Um, charity work, make happy. Uh, experiencing nature, this creates happiness. And finally, using and mastering your talents. So you, you see already that if our societal project, if the project of policy making takes this into account, what actually produces sustainable happiness for a large number of people, 
it looks like it can't be that hard, right? People need to have their, their material needs um, uh, provided, but besides that, what we need is actually relatively A, cheap, and B, very conducive to a collaborative society. Giving, social life, all these things um, make people happy provingly. So what does that mean? Is paradise lost? Will we never be able to come into paradise because our thinking is just too bad for it? We weren't made to live in this uh, complex society? I don't believe so. I, I believe there's two things that can help us. The first thing is debiasing. Um, we humans have been uh, made with this flaw in our brains that we make thinking mistakes, but we're also very flexible creatures. And big studies have actually shown that we can train ourselves out of many of the thinking mistakes that we make. And the second big part is that I believe that artificial intelligence uh, might play a huge role in improving our thinking. Because imagine you had a buddy who has uh, no cognitive limitations, who has limitless memory, and who always stands by your side, and whenever you don't know which decision to take, they can tell you based on past experience, based on access to enormous data. So I think these two will play a huge role in making our, humanities, uh, our humanity advance in our thinking. And um, if you ask yourself, what can we do right now? What can we start with right away? I would suggest three points. First of all, own your own happiness and your biases. Because we know today so much about how we can debias ourselves and create happiness in our lives, yet the, f the fewest of us actually do these things. So one way would be to just Google debiasing and happiness courses and start right away. And I think if you notice, how easy it is to achieve, improving your thinking, achieving happiness, getting a happier person and spreading that energy, um, it might make you an evangelist of these methods and it might uh, have a huge ripple effect. The next thing is to question common biases and beliefs because as we just saw, nobody's immune to these thinking errors. And whenever you hit an obstacle and somebody tells you that something is not possible, they might very often be, be basing this statement on an illusion of competence. And finally, develop data literacy. I think we just uh, heard a similar point because I think there's no way around our future being built on data because we don't have the cognitive capacity to deal with the capacity of today's world. So we will be relying on data. But the problem is that uh, A, data is being built currently by people that have not been exposed much to, for example, to ethics, to policy making, etc. And on the other hand, people that legislate data at the moment usually have a hard time sending a tweet or doing something like that. So the more of us understand how large data works, how deep learning works, machine learning, and these things are getting easier and easier to control, the more we will be able to impact how data is being built in the future. So I would invite you to discover the inner idiot in you along with me and uh, get on this train of, of discovering improved thinking. And uh, I think there's a lot of... Uh, Happiness to be found in better societies. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ange Pirka, encouraging us all to discover the inner idiots in all of us. By the way, actually, remember everybody who, who stands on stage here this afternoon, a little bit later on, as I say, the speed dating, it'll be a chance to grab a coffee, grab a drink, and, and, and chat more about what they've been talking about, if, you, if you're even more curious as well. Remember, we have our hashtag as well, hashtag EFB10. EFB10 is everything you hear, not everything you hear, but quotes that you like, things that you like to share out among, uh, among your communities online. I'm sure you can pop, that, pop those down on Twitter, social networks, and uh, a little bit of what's happening here, we can spread outside as well. Right, we are ready now to move on to our next uh, speaker. Next week, actually, uh, began her career as the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Serbia. And uh, from, from then on, she actually went on to uh, found a change-making non-profit. Some of you from uh, locally may have heard of that, Serbia on the Move, and also is responsible for, responsible for, leading, for the Leading Change Network as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Anna Babovic. Hi, everyone. Um, as a first speaker from Belgrade, let me first welcome you to my favorite city in the world. Um, I hope it treats you well so far. Um, secondly, it's my great pleasure to be here today, and I want to thank you, uh, Hedwig and the EFB team, for inviting me to share my thoughts with you. Um, and let me tell you something. The EFB journey for me started six years ago. Um, and I've been always very proud and happy to be a part of that 
group of vi vibrant group of lively and enthusiastic people from the region. Um, however, in these past six years, it has given me so many brothers and sisters um, that it became family. Um, and I want to congratulate you for 10 years of your existence, Hedwig and the EFB team, um, and to wish you all the best in the future. We hope uh, you'll be around for a long, long time, and we are happy to be part of it. Um, so today, um, I'm going to speak, and whenever I have a microphone like this, I feel like I should sing. Don't worry, you're safe, I'm not going to do it, um, but it's a little weird. Um, so today, I'm going to um, talk about a concept, a topic, um, that is a very small word, but it causes troubles to a lot of people around the world. Um, it's a concept that everyone knows about, and everyone knows how deeply it influences people on the basis of whether they believe they have it or they don't. Um, and finally, it's a word that, um, or concept or thing that everyone has, but not everyone knows about it. So we are going to talk about the power. Um, before we start, let me ask you how many of you, and I will ask you to, to stand up, um, those of you who ever, once at least in your life, felt that you are powerless. Can you please stand up? At least once in your life. No, no, stand up, stand up. At least once in your life you felt that you can't do anything about something. Okay, I see some lazy people who don't want to stand up. Okay, and now, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Those of you who decided to do something about it, to do at least something to change that situation of being powerless, to sit down. Okay, so in majority of cases, that is how people, people understand the power as something that they have or don't. And either you can have it or you don't, you can't do much about it. Um, and today we are going to talk about misconceptions about power. Let me first tell you how I learned about it. So, I, oops, I was born as a second child, um, and with a birth, I got my older sister. So when I was, I'm this chubby one, obviously, right? Um, so when I was in my in walking chair, she believed that I should do uh, vacuum cleaning. And of course, I was little. I couldn't walk at the time. I didn't believe I could do it, right? So, but on the other hand, I couldn't talk. I couldn't defend myself. So I started biting her. Whenever she would force me to do vacuum cleaning, I would bite her. And that's, that's I guess, how I learned a power of resistance as well. However, as the time was um, passing by, she was acquiring some resources before me. So she was the one who would have, you know, branded clothing, perfumes, um, everything that you need, right? And I was super interested in her resources. On the other hand, she didn't care about my resources at all. So if my interest in her resources are higher than her interest in my resources, who do you think have power? So my interest in her resources are higher than her interest in my resources. Who is more powerful in that relationship? She, of course. So, all of a sudden, whenever I would take, wanted to take something, like perfume, she would condition it with something. Like, oh, fine, but you should do vacuum cleaning, of course, instead of me. However, as the time went by, I was growing up as well. And I started acquiring some of resources that she became interested in, branded clothing, perfumes. But also, I started to stay up late and to see her coming home a little later than she was supposed to, or talking over the phone through the whole night with her boyfriend. So who had the power then? Of course. So this is how it works. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't, but when you don't have power, you're thinking how you should actually use your resources to get of course, I didn't think about power too much in my life, but at some point in my life, I became advisor to the deputy prime minister. And all of a sudden, people started to show a lot of respect, sometimes even kind of fears, and all of a sudden, people started calling me to do a whole bunch of different kinds of favors to them. 
And of course, that was bothering me a lot always. But then one day, my father called. He was like, can you please do one little favor to the whole neighborhood? And I was like, what are we talking about? So he was like, can you please call the office of the mayor and ask them to come and clean up the park in front of our building? And that park is huge, like thousands of people are using it every day. So I was like, excuse me, can you repeat what are you asking me to do? And why would I in, on earth do it? So he said, like, you know what? You have the power. So if you call them from, of course, the office of the deputy prime minister, they are going to come tomorrow and to clean up the park. And that was very shocked, not only because my father asked me to do that, the guy who was always organizing like the whole neighborhood to do cleanup, but actually that those 1,000 people who are visiting that park every day didn't believe they should do something about it. And then at that moment, I realized that actually power is the ability to achieve the purpose. And I realized that my role is not to use my position in the government to you know, like help people do something, but actually to start working with people, to empower them to realize actually that they have power to do stuff. So I started an organization that is called Serbia on the Move, and that is actually developing leadership within people to make the change. So it's how it works. Power in, for, so, for social change, it works that you have a person who starts gathering other people, and then those people start thinking creatively about how they can turn resources that they have into the power that they need to create the change that they want. And I know it sounds sometimes very confusing, so I'm going to show you a video of one campaign that we led um, four years ago. And if I asked you four years ago if moms in Serbia have power, you would laugh. If majority of people laughed at us at that time. However, we started the campaign and you're going to see a little video about it and then you're going actually to see when I'm talking about power shifts and power changes, how we made it happen in Serbia. Can we have the video now? This is a story about Dunja Ivanovic, a hard-working and fully employed mom. Last year, she got the most precious gift, a daughter, Natalia. But she couldn't, like a majority of moms in Serbia, enjoy these moments carelessly. No matter how cute babies are, they need a bunch of things, which moms and their families have to provide. In the first month, Dunja and her husband spent his whole salary. In the second month, they borrowed the money from their parents. In the third month, they realized they needed to take a loan. Why? In Serbia, new moms on maternity leave don't get their salary on time. Dunja wasn't the only one, but she was alone. What options did she have? To continue borrowing money and repaying debts in the future? To, to get a divorce and apply to become a contestant and marry Donald Trump? Or to join Serbia on the Move in their campaign, Rights for Moms? All of a sudden, she realized she is not alone. Their first act was to announce their presence. One morning, in every part of Belgrade, baby's laundry was hanged on main streets and squares. People started asking, why is it hanging there? To unveil the secret, they organized a gathering in front of the National Parliament on the morning of March the 8th, 2014. 150 people announced the beginning of the campaign, with a simple goal, to get 250 moms to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with 250 MPs, to convince them to vote for change of law, so moms get their salary on time. For Serbia, the chosen tactic was highly improbable. In two weeks, 250 moms sent over 250 emails contacting MPs. No response. One day, 30 different moms called office assistants and asked for 30 different meetings with MPs. Politicians realized moms are quite serious. One after another, they were persuaded. Those who didn't get the first meetings soon realized they needed to do it before it's too late. So they were calling moms for meetings. Moms decided to build the power in the parliament first and then go to the government. On the day before the meeting, they issued a press release saying that moms have majority in parliament. We only need the minister's support. Did he have any option? On the 1st of July, moms declared victory. 
Since the minister promised an amendment by the end of the year and invited the campaign's core team to work on the amendments. Who wants to mess with mom? Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this was one example of how we actually shifted power from those who believed that they don't have, that they can't do anything about it to actually become power, pow powerful enough to change the law. The law has been adopted last year um, in Serbia and actually the, the number of women who are eligible to, to, to um, use the maternity leave payment grew significantly. So we added additional changes to that law, not only the one that we requested at the beginning. Um, but this is what I do. Um, I play with power uh, and I find um, creative people who want to actually think about how we can strategically shift power from one side to the other. Um, and I want to wrap it up here by asking you two things. One, that if you are in the position of power, to think about those who put you in that position and to think about what is that they need so that they don't need to get organized against you. Um, and second, if you ever pe feel powerless in your life, um, to get your team together and to start thinking how you can turn your resources into the power that you need to create the change that you want. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together for Anna Babovic. Some inspirational words, wise words from Anna. Thank you so much. Right, so we move on now to our next next speaker this afternoon. So I'm just going to go back back to um, March 2017. I was asked to to host a an event, an event at the European Commission. So it was an event for the European Women Women Innovator of the Year 2017. So, so a very high profile event, a very pro profile, high profile event with lots of high profile politicians um, and more importantly many, many different um, innovators, women innovators who are doing some really great things across Europe, very diverse, all in their own way, all in their own way, very strong indeed. The winner was announced uh, I didn't actually get to meet the winner, but afterwards, afterwards, I discovered, I discovered that uh, we both had very strong Croatian connections. Today, this afternoon, I actually met her for the first time, said hello, and uh, spoke about a few things. And uh, so we have, we're very delighted to actually have the European Woman Innovator of the Year 2017 on this stage to share with you ideas right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the founder of UK Design Innovation Lab, Lab Stromotolite, and also the Music Tech Festa founder as well. Please put your hands together for Mihaela Magas. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm massively inspired by the talks that I've just heard. And I just can't wait to connect to some of the people who have just spoken. Um, there's just so much wonderful stuff going on in this conference. Earlier on, I connected with some of the uh, wonderful creative entrepreneurs um, that are operating in the areas of um, Serbia, Kosovo, Pristina, um, I want to showcase them to the world. I keep saying this to people. I, I keep saying to people when they ask me, how are we going to promote this region abroad? Um, and I say, they say, shall we send some people to cook something? And I say, well, no, send young people who are doing amazing things. Showcase our intelligence to the world. Um, this is us fitting, um, fitting um, our Commissioner for Innovation um, Carlos Moedas with neurofeedback sensors uh, back in July last year um, and uh, his brain activity was being visualized in front of uh, an audience of 700 VIPs during question time. This is the kind of things that um, our community does. The Music Tech First community is a, a global innovation community that now counts over 6,500 members and I'm very proud to be able to present them. I founded this um, six years ago and it has grown exponentially. So I want to tell you a little bit more about um, what this community does because I think it's, um, there, there are many members from this area and I do want more of them to join because it's a wonderful global network that really fits with the ethos of what we're talking about here. 
Um, so this is us at the, the London Symphony Orchestra in the Barbican in London with the Brainwave Quartet. Um, the community is united by this passion for innovation at the junction of art and science and academia and industry. And it really welcomes everybody. It is so diverse and so inclusive. Um, it has, um, I think this probably illustrates it best. This is us in Wellington in New Zealand. And these are people who are uniting old technologies and new technologies. And we had Maori and Polynesian artists rushing to us, asking us to fit their wonderful carved instruments with new kinds of technological um, devices and then allowing them to express themselves in new ways. Now, this is quite fundamental to what we do. Um, of course, um, there are um, political divides that we unite. This is us in Berlin. It's Rani Dar from Israel and Ahmad Bakri from the Palestine. We had to fight to get a visa for Ahmad. Uh, we don't visit the States at the moment because I do not go anywhere without all of our community. And therefore, I will not risk anybody not getting a visa. Um, music is our social glue. Music is what does it at the core. But people who come into this community come from all kinds of backgrounds and work with across disciplines. So for instance, this is a system by Robertina Shebjanic from Ljubljana that unites art and science in the sense that it unites sound and feedback from biological systems, in this case, um, jellyfish, and this got actually an honor, uh, honorable mention pre Ars Electronica. And uh, of course, uh, there are people of all ages, and the children are absolutely phenomenal. They are, um, after three hours of interacting uh, with our community, they develop a passion for technology, for engineering, for uh, creativity. And the important thing is that the new tools that they build allow them to express themselves in front of audiences. No matter how shy, we insist they need to go on stage and showcase what they have done. They're usually very frightened, but after they get this huge acknowledgement from the audiences, absolutely love it. What happens is that they gain this enormous passion, confidence um, to, to progress further. So, with this wonderful, wonderful community and this incredible brains, um, we experienced several jaw-dropping moments. Um, during the build-up of this community. This is one of them in November um, uh, in 2016, the last month of presidency, Obama's presidency. He was asked to curate, or rather a guest edit, an edition of Wired magazine and choose the Future Technology Frontiers. And our community and the champion of our community, Victoria Modesta, was one of them. This is Victoria Modesta. Um, when our community surpassed 5,000 members, I decided that we needed a role model. And it needed to be female. It needed to be someone who was courageous, who could take any challenge, who really embraced opportunities. And Victoria certainly was one of them. She opened the Paralympics both in London and in Rio. She is now a director's fellow of MIT. And our community fitted her with all kinds of senses and special, gave a special, the possibility to express herself in new ways and, and have special abilities. So the point was not to turn someone into someone who's normal. We don't use that word at all. In fact, we don't accept anybody as being normal. The point was that here was an opportunity to give someone the, op uh, the opportunity to be so special that everybody else could aspire to them. So in this case, um, her prosthetic leg was designed by a phenomenal uh, a fashion tech um, designer, Anouk Wiprecht, to create smoke for the stage. And an image that resulted was like a new take on the famous Marilyn Monroe image in the white dress, except with a completely different take on it. Of course, the rest of um, her outfit is carbon fiber and sensor enabled. And she was able to do all kinds of things. Um, this is uh, still from the MIT Media Lab documentary that was made about, uh, about our labs in Berlin. And she was able to, she was fitted with neurofeedback sensors. And she was able to control from her brain the color of her dress. 
Now, how does this work? We combine science and art. Um, we use, our community uses um, methods from clinical trials for people who have uh, anxiety attacks. And these are usually, um, their brain activity is usually visualized for their benefit so they can see when their brain pattern changes and therefore they can start to train to control their brain activity. Now, the same system can be used to activate from your brain all kinds of other things and in this case it was tested with Victoria who trained to change color and therefore gave a, a new method of expression. Now, we took this further. Let's see if we can get the next one. We took this further in Slush. Um, you're probably aware of Slush. It's the biggest European convention of startups. And uh, we were asked to open Slush. And we decided to do it not with a three-minute pitch, the classic startup pitch, but with a 20-minute performance. Because for the five days previous to this, we gathered some of the best brains from our community into one lab and said, right, let's just blow them away and let's showcase how technology can truly affect a human being. Now, in order to showcase that, three minutes is not enough. It needs to be an experience. This is... Um, Vika Haninen, she's a blind singer, very proud to be a blind singer from the Sibelius Institute, a vocal coach, an absolutely amazing artist. And the first thing we did with Rika was to say, what do you need when you're on stage? What are you missing? And she said, well, I can't see the audience. I don't know how they are reacting. So the first thing we did was something very simple. We asked for members of the audience to volunteer and we fitted them with pulse sensors so that Rika, and connected them to Rika so she could feel the heartbeat of the audience and react to it. The people who are on the stage here, um, who form the band, are actually scientists, computer scientists, neuroscientists, um, accessibility designers, other types of designers, uh, artists. This is the audience um, with the pulse sensors. And This is Yasmin Isdrake. She is um, a really accomplished um, inventor, entrepreneur, and innovator in her own right, and a cyborg. She has three chip implants. Uh, two of them are in her wrists. The reason why she has them is because she has never been able to scream or raise her voice. And these implants trigger um, alarms in her devices in case of danger. Now, she was able to convey, uh, she was able to activate some of the systems on stage with her implants. She was also able to transmit to Rika via vibration. This is an implant in her heart, in this tattoo, she has a chip. And she was able to convey to Rika her movements and her actions on stage. So this is another thing we did. Rika was also uh, enabled with um, devices which allowed her to um, uh, to create special effects without having to navigate menus. And these were from our accessibility designers. And the, uh, but when I say we have jaw-dropping moments, on the second day of the lab, we used that same system for, from clinical trials to activate the musical scale. And most people in the lab were taking at least two hours to be able to hit a note or go up and down a scale. And then she came and she put this neurofeedback sensor is on, and she was able to play without training. Now, at that moment, the jaw drops in the room because we realized that someone who had previously, in our mechanical world, been considered disabled or less able-bodied than the rest of us, when it comes to brain-computer interfaces, is far more able-bodied. And these are the sort of things that inspire us to go forward. We have created entire systems that support these people. Um, there have been uh, toolkits and programs and pilots we ran with all kinds of mechanisms. And this, is, this one we tested. We tested the registration of newly created IP um, in, in the blockchain during, during these labs in Slush. So, as a result of our pilots, these are the kinds of things that happen. These are the sort of people who have ended up receiving all kinds of recognition as a result of the measures we took. But you will also notice that 
we are very much gender equal. In fact, we can sort of have a lab, a technology lab that's all women. And that's kind of quite rare. Um, and so for our flagship in uh, Stockholm this year, uh, we have decided to invite all women to take the lead of technology areas from the wonderful Imogen Heap with mycelia and blockchain all the way to the famous professor Danica Kragic, who is world leader in um, robotics and AI. And just one last jaw-dropping moment. Uh, this was back in 2014 uh, when we were running in Boston or rather Cambridge MA in Microsoft Nerd Labs. And then a, a number of luminaries from the academic world got inspired by the festival and by this wonderful community and declared that this was a transdisciplinary platform. And at that point, I decided that, or rather I understood better, that we had a tool which united everybody across borders and we united everybody who had something to say or something to contribute. And all these wonderful brains were able to help us invent the future. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together for Mihaela Magas. I think you'll agree with me, the, um, the tools just get better and better, don't they? Right, we move on now to our next Next speaker. Next speaker actually has written five books. Each of those five books feature the entrepreneurship at the crossroads of business and society. And in fact, USA, USA Today publication, they describe uh, this gentleman as one of the country's leading authorities on ethics in the business world. We're glad, we're, we're honored, we're happy, delighted to have him here right on this stage, ready to share his ideas with you right now. Ladies, and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of San Francisco, Mr. David Batson. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here and join all this illustrious crowd of, of, of intellectuals and activists um, to look toward the future. Uh, my story starts in San Francisco, my hometown. Uh, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, um, investing and uh, building companies in technology information. And really unexpectedly one day, I discovered that my favorite restaurant in the San Francisco Bay Area was the center of a human trafficking ring that had brought over 500 teenagers from the area of Bangalore, India, into San Francisco, first to work in the restaurant, and then taken out to fruit and vegetable fields and brothels in Northern California. Modern slavery, forced labor in the 21st century. It was really such a shock to me that I decided that I would go around the world and see if I could investigate how this could happen and what, was the, uh, what were the reasons for it. And if I can get to my slide, there we go. So I, I took a year leave of absence from my uh, investment bank, and I went around the world to do this investigation. I followed the money from San Francisco to Bangalore, Los Angeles, where I had encountered 112 women who were forced to sew clothes every day, locked in a factory. I went to Thailand to, to pursue that. So I went to every continent, and during that journey, I learned that there's over 30 million people living in forced labor. This is not cheap labor or sweatshops. These are people who cannot walk away or leave. So I decided that um, in, the, in, in my investigation, as I met people, um, I said, okay, I can do something about it. I, I met a woman in Northern Thailand who had rescued um, 150 children. If you've seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire, she pulled them off the streets and we build a village together in Northern Thailand. These kids grow their own food. We were able to get them into the school system and today they're university graduates. We went to Lima, Peru, and again, I met local Peruvians who were rescuing kids out of situations of being in the child sex industry or forced to work in factories or forced to beg in the streets. And again, we built shelters. And I have to say, after five years, building shelters and services in 10 countries, it struck me that when we come into a, a, a place where we want to do something about a social or environmental problem, we open our hearts. 
but we shut down our brains. And this is what I mean by that. I was building shelters all over the world, but I found that I was at the end of a river, pulling bodies out as they were drowning and flailing. It hit me that I needed to go upstream. I needed to figure out what were the causes for why this happened. But even more so, when it comes to services or perhaps we do advocacy or maybe we do some kind of other work trying to change corporations through corporate social responsibility, we build organizations that are not sustainable and rely on charity. Meanwhile, in my Silicon Valley world, we would go after the top capital, talent, and technology to build scalable enterprises. Of course, we all know that having another version of this is so much more important than global warming. So much more important than saving children out of human trafficking, or extreme poverty, or malaria. But why is it when I'm trying to solve those problems, I don't go for capital, I go for donations. I don't get talent, I get volunteers. And I get secondhand computers. So I thought, what if I flip the model? What if I tried to go upstream and actually use the same things that I do in the world of business to do in the world of social change? So I followed my own map. I decided to bring together the 50 most influential people I knew and ask them to help me think through a problem and solve it. Now, I didn't know any of you, but I'm sure you'd be one of my 50. Okay? My network over the years, uh, the founder of Twitter, I got the, a, a baseball player for a professional team in San Francisco, the owner of the largest bank in, in, San, in, in Australia, um, the largest healthcare company and online internet that went public. I asked these people to come together and I presented to them a challenge in the Amazon of Peru. And, and I, I showed them the rich resource, resources of that area, that the opportunities of the people, but here are these indigenous native people were taken advantage of. Their children would end up in our shelters in Lima, Peru. So I said, listen, come up with the best idea that you have that would be a business solution for this problem. Not a charity solution, come up with a business solution. And then in a fit of irrational exuberance, I said, whatever idea you come up with, my team will do on Monday morning. Stupidest thing I've ever said. Because they came up with an idea I knew nothing about. They decided that we should build a beverage company and take the rich herbs that come out of the Amazon, maca root, mate, guaisana leaf, una de gato, and take these rich herbs and create sustainable, fair jobs for the people of the Amazon so that they are not so exploited that we are inoc inoculating them by creating economic and social platforms where they are empowered, right? And then let's sell those beverages in mainstream markets in the United States and Europe and tell the story of how we're sourcing and then return those profits back to the communities to invest in their infrastructure. It sounds fantastic, unless you're the person on Monday morning who has to do this, right? So, Monday morning, I'm thinking, okay, uh, I'm, working in the, I'm working in the social change world. What do I do? Oh, I remember that woman has a lemonade. She was really cool, and she worked for a social agency. Let's see if we can make... No, you don't do that. What do you do in Silicon Valley? You say, I'm going to find the best beverage maker in the United States, and I'm going to get that person to build this for me. All right? So I go to him. He had just sold a company to Coca-Cola for his beverage. Right? It was a coconut water. And I said, okay, listen, I want you to build this beverage. And then I say, you know, but I can't pay you what other people will pay you to build a new company because I'm doing it for good. No, you don't do that. You say, look, I will match whatever else anyone's going to give you to build your next company. I'll give you salary. I'll give you equity, the same as anyone else. And then I convinced him based on, wow, I'll get that equity, I'll get that salary, and I'll be doing good in the world. He said, absolutely. Tuesday morning, after he accepts, I'm like, okay, now how am I going to pay him what I just promised him? Oh, my God, I have the best beverage maker in the United States who's going to create a company with me. You've got to invest in this company. And there goes the story of Rebel. Rebel, roots, extract, bark, berry, and leaves. Be a rebel. Don't drink the same old crap everybody else drinks. Drink something that's healthy for you, rich herbs, that are good for your system, the future of beverage, 
but also good for the people who source them. Rebel today, five years later, is the number one health beverage in America. We started by sourcing our ingredients in the Amazon, in at-risk communities. Now we source in 36 countries around the world. My experiment then went to the Netherlands, and I'm really rushing through this. We said, okay, if this worked in the Amazon, what would it look like in the red light district of the Amazon, of, 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 the, of, the, of the Amsterdam? Young women who were being brought from Eastern Europe, being managed in order to sell their bodies every day in the red light district. I met this woman, Tos Heemskirk, who for 18 years has been working with these young women. We decided that we would start a soup company together, right? Not a soup kitchen where you give away soup to these poor women who are behind. No, empower them through being our customers and then our employees. First, we started a kitchen in the red light district, and we went out and got the best chef in the Holland that we could get to be able to be our master chef. And we started to sell the soup initially to the women behind the windows. They were our first customers. And then we got called in by the chief of police because we didn't have a business license. But he said, you know what? We hear it's the best soup. We said, it absolutely is. So he said, would you start sourcing and bringing the soup to our precincts? I tell you, if you're going to start a company, get sex workers and cops on board, you've got a great demographic. Okay? Then the uh, largest grocery store chain in Holland said, you know, we want to commercialize your soup. Could we want to sell it in our stores? We said, fantastic. Now I've got a problem. I have a lot of demand. I don't have enough supply. So we start a culinary school. And I talked to the naked chef, Jamie Oliver. He helped me design a culinary school for these young women. We now have 40 young women who are coming out of the commercial sex industry, making the choice to be chefs rather than the, law, the limited choices they have. The great story about this, the mayor of Amsterdam sees what we're doing, goes, you know what, I'm going to be closing down half the red light district. I want to give you a brothel to start a restaurant. And so today we have a restaurant called Dignita, Dignity. And then we opened a second restaurant due to the great profits of the first restaurant. And this month we're opening our third. We do not advertise that the sex workers are our chefs or our caterers. People go there because it's the best brunch in Amsterdam, Dignita. So... That model, you start to think about it, we're still doing intervention. But if I stay at the level of intervention and I stay at the level of services, what I'm not doing is scaling my impact. What we do is by engaging ourselves in the real problems of people who are in crisis. And we learn about their assets, their opportunities, their resources, their capacities, their human capacities. Then we can build enterprises that scale from one group of communities of native people to 36 countries where we choose not to source what's the cheapest ingredient, but what will create the most impact by the way that we source our turmeric? What will be the most impact by the way we source our, our maca? Right, so it keeps going from here because once you build that supply chain, once you build that credibility that indeed you can bring about the raise of capital, the deployment of capital in a more democratic fashion. See, today, the problem is we have feudal capitalism. We have monopolistic capitalism. People who are outside that 1% of the world that manage capital are left out of the potential to develop and make choices for themselves. So how do we extend that? How do we take the same tools, the same resources that we have in order to bring about a better world? You see, it's something very strange about the fact. When I go to great institutions like INSEAD in France or Harvard or Stanford, and I tell what I do, I'll have some student raises their hand and say, oh my gosh, I love what you do. You know, if I can't get a job at Google or Goldman Sachs, I'd love to come work for you. I'm like, what the hell? Why would I want you? But the presumption is because I'm doing good in the world, we would have less talent. We'll take whoever can come in the door. We'll take whatever money we can get, a government grant. We'll get a donation. Fuck that. Let's start creating a world where we expect the best and the brightest the best capital to come towards things that matter. Let's build those companies, let's build that human capital, and let's engage people who get left out because the future is free for those who are not for sale. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together for David Batson. <laughs> David, one thing, one thing, once again, once again, the name of that restaurant. So the next time, the next time you're in Amsterdam, you need to go to this restaurant, the name of it. It's called Dignita, and there's three uh, places in Amsterdam where you can go. 
We'll be opening one in Uganda and in San Francisco. So Hard Rock Cafe, watch out. We're coming after your ass. Let's see. Wonderful. Okay, we move on. On now to the next speaker. Speaker, we've already heard her name from a previous speaker a little bit earlier on. Uh, somebody who's actually an analyst, futurist, information systems designer, political scientist, technical creative director, with, uh, with a record of award-winning product development over 25 years. And listen, if that's not enough, she's also a super forecaster. Now, what on earth is a super forecaster? Who knows what a super forecaster is? Hands up, let me see. Three people, four people, five people, six. She's going to tell you more about that and what she does and what a super forecaster does as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Regina Joseph. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I want to thank first uh, EFB for having me here. Um, I've, been, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with them for a couple of years now. So it brings me, uh, gives me great pleasure to be here today uh, to talk to all of you. And uh, indeed, I do have a title. I cop to a title of Super Forecaster, although that is not a title of my own design. It was foisted on me uh, through a program, uh, an experimental program that was run by an agency called the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, also known as IARPA. Their logo is Be the Future. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the future because, as I'm sure you've experienced today, we've actually had, um, hmm, clicker. Maybe this clicker is not working. Maybe it's this one. Uh, so, we're going to be talking a little bit about the future because um, this morning I actually started counting the number of times that I heard the word future being used. I stopped at 78, actually, um, because it was just getting a little too onerous for me. But what was interesting for me is that whenever I hear, when I go to a lot of conferences like this, and when I do attend conferences like these, when we are talking about the future, I notice a somewhat worrying trend. That's not exclusive to this particular gathering. It's fairly common in most of these types of discussions. What do we mean when we say the word future? For most of us, because it is true that as human beings, we are forecasting animals. Our minds are constantly focused on future events. The problem is how we express that understanding. And one of the things that is really important to, to get, a, get a grip on is when we're talking about the future, how often we're really talking about the past. Or, in the words of uh, one of our earlier speakers who actually was uh, quoting Milorad Dodik, a very elegant expression of uh, the never-ending temporary, which I think is a very fancy way of saying the word the present, right? So, when we talk about the word future, uh, it's very difficult for us to get a grip on it because it means different things to many different people, mostly because they have an emotional attachment to what they think is going to happen in the future. Right? Most of the time, we're concerned with what we wish our future outcomes to be rather than what the evidence shows that future might wind up looking, uh, how it might wind up looking. So what I'd like to do as a sort of initial exercise today is to actually talk about the future and to map three particular vectors uh, that I'm working on uh, in some of the research work that I do. So we're going to examine a little bit some of the geopolitical vectors uh, uh, that are gathering uh, through the course of the 2020s. The expected date, the end point of this discussion, is around the year 2030. So what can we expect out of three vectors that are going to come in the next three years? The first is these massive shifts in uh, demography. Right? This is not confined to a particular region. This is looking at things from a global perspective. Right? The next is the human machine age transformation. We're just at the cusp of it. We haven't really experienced the totality of what that's going to look like. And then the third vector is a need for cognitive security. What do I mean when I say cognitive security? For those of you who have lived or worked in environments where there is, a, uh, there is an impetus to distort or to deceive the information that you receive, right? That's something that all of us may have referred to in the past as propaganda. But what we're looking at right now from a technological perspective is new technologies that are not in the future. They are existing today, 
Uh, some developed in uh, places like uh, uh, University of Montreal in Canada and also at Stanford. New technologies that will allow us to actually uh, change the nature of what we see as recorded evidence. Right. We, we've entered a very interesting period in human history in which uh, the availability of techniques to uh, uh, ensure evidence, right, recorded audio, recorded video, that the technology uh, to actually fabricate deception has exceeded those techniques. And I'm talking about technologies that allow you to uh, take a picture or take a video of somebody and basically superimpose that on a video of somebody else and make it sound as if they're doing and saying things attributed to somebody else. Right? These are technologies that exist today. So when we talk about cognitive security, what I really mean by that is how do we protect our own minds? How do we protect ourselves from forces that really aim to change how we perceive, how we think, and most of all, how we behave? So I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I do want to explain a little bit about these three factors in a little bit more detail. So when we talk about the demographic shifts in labor, uh, some of the things that I'm talking about is the era of abundant and cheap labor, what we all sort of perceive as you know, what was coming out of China, India, and places in, in Asia, that is going to come to its maturation point in, during the 2020s. Also, women entering into the marketplace will peak in the 2020s. So all of those will be factored into our economies. And then finally, the global aging workforce, right? Countries like China, Japan, we're reaching now percentages where their populations are actually much older than the percentages of people who are reaching, who are in younger categories. From a machine age transformation perspective, some of the three characteristics that you can expect in that are things like scarcity of workers with highly paid skills. We talk a lot about AI, we talk a lot about data science, and various people have mentioned the fact that it's very, very difficult to find people who have that level of expertise, right? That's going to increase. <clears throat> Uh, digital natives versus digital immigrants, people who were born digital, right, rather than older demographics that are only just getting exposed to it. And then finally, the relationship to machines, right? We, we had in Saudi Arabia uh, this year the first robot given legal personhood, right? These are just some of the elements that we're just starting to grapple with today. And then some of the vectors from a cognitive security perspective, things like an international divide uh, in terms of net access. Authoritarian countries see in access to the net as something that is a sovereign right, whereas countries that lean more towards the democratic side of the spectrum see it as a public utility. On which side you fall affects how you use it, whether you use it for censorship against adversaries, both foreign and domestic, or whether you see it as an innovation boom. Right? Some of the other characteristics include things like reality blindness, how attentive are we to things that are happening in the world around us and how much is being used to distort that awareness? And then finally, information inequality. People who have access to the best information will be the ones who win in an information age. So when you take all of these, th these three things together, the next 10 to 15 years are going to be rather rocky, right? So how can we protect ourselves? Well, somebody who works in the field of information design and also somebody who worked in an experimental program that was designed to use the, the development of probabilistic assessments about our future outcomes, being able to predict with accuracy, utilizing science rather than emotion or rather than, well, this is what I thought occurred in the past, and so I'm going to use that as a way to express what I'm going to do in the future. And all of this it's not necessarily in service of decision making, of, of uh, uh, forecasting per se, but it's really about decision making. How do you make better decisions? How can I train people to be better decision makers? Because a lot of that depends upon their perception. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results that came from a program that I launched uh, back in 2016 for the Dutch government. And so I call it the Strategic Foresight and Analysis Program. So in this program, <clears throat> it was the course of over one year, we just started the second year of the program. So over the course of one year, I had 55 forecasters taken from 13 different ministries in the Netherlands, everything from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, the Intelligence Services, Ministry of Public Health and Safety, and put them into eight teams. <clears throat> Those teams were expected to work along the lines of their informational advantage. Those teams were given four workshops over the course of one year, 
Each workshop had a very specific intent. Workshop one focused on how to think like a super forecaster, meaning how do I use information? How do I go out and use my critical reasoning skills, my ability to gather information, process that information, and synthesize that information to make accurate forecasts about geopolitical events? Second workshop was about cognitive debiasing. And thank you to Andre uh, for, for, for talking about that, warming up the crowd a little bit for me. And so <clears throat> uh, uh, the two other workshops, last workshop was a post-mortem to give people the opportunity to see how well they did. Third workshop being an actual analytical structure technique, so how to train people, how to do proper analysis. And so these uh, 55 forecasters were given 50 questions, 50 geopolitical questions on which they were asked to make probabilistic forecasts over the course of one year, and they were scored on it. So their accuracy was actually being scored using a, a proper scoring rule. It's a statistical rule called the Breyer score, and we've used it in the past with the uh, work at IARPA, and we continue to use that, uh, use that uh, uh, scoring system. So what we saw at the end of it was that there were distinct gains in knowledge. There were uh, distinct uh, uh, changes in terms of the capacity for people to change how resistant they were and how resilient they were against biases to information and how well they processed that information and how accurate they became when they started talking about future events. Now, you say, well, I have no idea what that means to be in a forecasting tournament, right? Because after I give people the workshops, what I really want to do is I want to test how well they were able to internalize the information that I gave them and apply that in the context of a forecasting tournament. So what you see here is the platform that I developed. And basically, you see a list of questions posed up here with a couple of different visualizations as to how other people are looking at these, uh, uh, at these questions. And here you see an individual questions page. You have a little bit more information about the question. And you give a, a person the ability to actually see how other forecasters are forecasting on it. And also, they can make their own forecasts. And at the end, after they've gone through a year of it, there's a leaderboard. It's a game, because ultimately, I'm testing people to see how accurate they are. They get a score, and they're on a leaderboard. So you can see it's a completely transparent and open environment. And so one of the, one of the, the lessons about, uh, or of, the, of the many lessons that come out of this, one of the things is, what does this mean for this region, for example? Well, what we know is that when we actively get people to understand what biases are, when we get them to change the way they assess things from using words to using numbers, using probabilities, their accuracy actually goes up rather dramatically. Right? And that is significant because when you are talking in geopolitics about very polarizing situations, right, one clear way to avoid polarizing debate is to put numbers on something. Make it evidence-based. Resist going into emotional representations of what you think was in the past and focus on how you're going to be able to express that with rigor so that you can really understand what is happening in the future. And with that, I want to thank you all and on to the next speaker. Right, thank you so much. Right, we move on now to our next session. Next speaker on the stage, ready to share their insights and their ideas with you. It's really, it's really quite simple. She's an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur with result, who's results driven and a creative, strategic thinker as well, who really simply appreciates fair play and strives for responsible development. She's going to tell you more about that now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage from Organic Farm, Salatica, Dunya Pejic. Hello, everyone. Uh, instead of introducing myself, I would rather tell you a story. It was uh, actually last year at the Civil Society Forum in Trieste, where I was invited to participate as a UAB alumni. And during the lunch break, we were standing outside and, uh, you know, just having the drinks and uh, chit-chatting with uh, everyone. Everything, every, everything was beautiful around us. So people were all dressed up and uh, it was really lively, uh, lively atmosphere. 
And um, I was chatting with a Macedonian guy, actually, and he asked me where I was from and, you know, uh, you know asked me about my work and that usual, you know, questions that you start conversation with. And I told him, I've been working in Ministry of Trade and Tourism for 15 years, my background is in tourism, but well, in my spare time, I'm actually dealing with agriculture, I'm, you know, I produce and, and, and sell organic vegetables. And he was really delighted with that agriculture part, and he said, hmm, that's amazing. So if I understood well, you were actually developing a strategy for, uh, develop, uh, for organic agriculture in Bosnia and Herzegovina in cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture. And I was like, uh, no, I literally grow the vegetables. <laughs> and then he said, hmm, but you do that at policy level? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I do that at ground level. <laughs> I actually dig the soil. <laughs> and uh, in that moment, I realized that I've been already implementing what should be written in that not existing policy, still not existing policy in Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina. So who am I? <laughs> I am just an ordinary public servant who started digging up the social change. But how come, how that unusual phenomenon happen, happen at all? Um, as I said, I, I've been working for the government for too many years. <laughs> and at some point I got frustrated with the inefficiency of public administration and I just needed to do something about it. So I uh, figured out that um, there is a family country house and some land around it, around it at my disposal. Uh, I realized that I have really, you know, need to do, do something meaningful, to do uh, something that concrete and, you know, which, which actually um, is uh, in accordance with uh, my being. Uh, I realized that uh, that place I always have a peace of mind, which is very, very important. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I figure out that I have no knowledge nor experience about agriculture at all, but did some research and find out that there is a huge market and, uh, well, I decided to take a risk. So. So I took a loan and invested in a professional greenhouse, uh, 500 meters uh, square big. And the initial plan was just to uh, grow the, organically grow the lettuce and sell it to the local market chain and, and that's it. And that initial idea actually transformed into something new and completely different and much better as I see it now. Uh, as soon as I got the first violation of the oral contract with, from the market chain side. <laughs> so they told me, how, yeah, I want just to tell you that this is, uh, this is me planting my first, first lettuce and of course it didn't survive. First lettuce ever. <laughs> so. Uh, they told me that I, my lettuce is um, uh, small and not big enough and that their consumers prefer those bigger. And um, then everything actually has, has changed. Uh, I realized that, I, you know, that consumers need to be educated, that market chains had no intention to invest in education and invest in raising awareness of the importance of the organic agriculture. Government actually at some point uh, put that issue on the agenda, uh, but uh, at some <laughs> later on put that agenda into the drawer. So I had no other choice than to change the track and start doing what should be done uh, by or um, with the cooperation uh, with, other, uh, with other stakeholders. Hmm. So, at that point, I was actually struggling with uh, those nematodes, uh, those little worms that live in the soil and, you know, eat the roots of the plants. And I openly wrote about it on, the face on my face Facebook page. And first my friends got caught about it. And <laughs> somehow they identified themselves with the suffering lettuce. And, you know, they started to see me as a 
some kind of alternative doctor who comes and cures the ilibi, the neem, nettle, and, and other, you know, um, natural, natural stuff. And nobody asked me anymore how I was. Everyone, you know, asked how Salatica was doing, and that was the moment when Salatica brand was actually, was actually born. Um, this is the first post on, on, on Salatica, on Salatica Facebook page, yeah. So, uh, this is kind of cute story, but still there is a social change I mentioned at the very, very beginning. It is. Uh, the promotion of the band was, brand was actually, band, <laughs> it sounds good also to have Salatica band as well. So promotion of the brand was actually based on the promotion of the core values that bring the social change. And when I say that, I'm talking about sustainability, I'm talking about uh, transparency, diversity, uh, cooperation, I'm talking about also identities and uh, fighting stereotypes. Uh, sustainability, can be <laughs> sustainability can be promoted without, you know, that overused term. If you buy food locally and you make friends with your farmer, not only that you will be aware of the food you eat and its origin and quality, but you will also help the air to be less polluted or, and you will boost the local local economy. Uh, this poster was also aimed to uh, initiate discuss discussion about stereotypes. Um, sorry, if I can have just a glass of water. Uh, to, yeah, this poster was aimed to, to initiate the discussion about stereotypes, fighting stereotypes and the identities also. Um, is it possible to be a public servant and a farmer at the same time? Uh, is it possible to be um, let's say a city girl and you know uh, the rural woman at the same time um, we have to choose between those identities or um, or our identity consists thank you very much or our identity consists of different aspects of, the, of our personality you can cheer for us a lot it's why I'm drinking Thank you very much. Diversity. Diversity was something which, uh, which I talked about quite, quite a lot. It doesn't matter if it was, you know, the story about uh, different sizes of the lettuce or the different colors of the tomatoes or different sorts of, of green beans. Diver the beauty lies in the diversity and uh, the main message which I wanted to, to, to communicate uh, was to embrace what is, you know, different from knobs, what is diff uh, to embrace what is, uh, uh, to embrace what uh, we are not used to, to, you know, to cheer it, to praise it, and not to be afraid of it, not to ignore it, uh, not to undermine it, of course. Uh, cooperation. Cooperation with those who you share uh, your values with is, uh, you know, the way, with the way to go. What you can see here is uh, what I call the morning edition of Salatica Box, which was delivered exclusively on Friday nights <laughs> and aimed to provide delicious, fresh, uh, healthy and genuine, you know, country breakfast for the family during the weekend. And it consists of Salatica vegetables, but also cheese and yogurt from the sustainable source uh, produced by a um, young couple from the nearby village. And also uh, there, are, uh, there were um, uh, free-range chicken eggs from my aunt. <laughs> Transparency, everything that was going on inside of the green uh, house or outside of the greenhouse or at, it was related in any kind with the, with, the, with the vegetables was documented and posted online. There were no hidden facts, no hidden, hidden, hidden acts. Uh, at, at, you know, if there, were, there was a problem, uh, consumers knew about it, they, they were also offered solutions and uh, they were able to express their opinion of how to treat, to treat something and, you know, to, 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 
get the better re result. So, um, in some very short time, um, people started to respond, and it was really crazy. I, I, I received so many messages of uh, people that I, you know, I've never met, I never heard of them. They were offering their help, actually. Others got inspired and started their own businesses. Media coverage was constantly growing. And um, awareness actually raised enough to, you know, to keep the things going. But um, at some point, by the end of the last, uh, by the end of the last summer, I actually, um, I actually burned out. I've been working two jobs for two years. Uh, I've been working for 16 hours per, per day, and at some point, you know, I, I really got burned, burned out. Not, not, not got burned, <laughs> just burned out. <laughs> I don't know if it is better or not, but uh, anyway, uh, I allowed myself to. Uh, to take a break, to make a step back, even to step out for a while and to, you know, to be able to see the whole picture. And what, what I actually can see now is that Salatica, well, Salatica could grow in so many ways. It could be, you know, a big regional project or it could be uh, just regular business or a business is with message. It's up to me, it's, it's the matter of choice. And that, my friends, that actually takes us back to the basics of democracy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there we are. Dunya Page, Salatica, who's already thinking of a Salatica band. Already that's on her mind. That could be something for next year. Salatita band, we could have, I don't know, Paprika on the drums, I don't know, Patlijan on the guitar. I don't know any other words in, in Serbian for, um, to, to, to join the band, but that could be something next year, 2019, the same place, same time with the Salatita band. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. She's not, not even listening, not even listening to that. But talk to her afterwards, I'm sure she'll go for it. Salat, it's a band. Go for it, we'll do it next year. Absolutely, right. Right, we move on. We move on to, uh, to actually our final speaker of the afternoon. And I think you'll agree with me, until now, it's, it's uh, been quite uh, an interesting, quite an intriguing afternoon. Lots of, of different ideas and, and insights that, that have really made us all think, think harder, think deeper all about, perhaps about ourselves, perhaps about what we're doing and, uh, and moving forward as well. So our next speaker, in fact, was previously the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria and actually involved on the e-government and, and participated in drafting the Bulgarian e-voting legislation as well. A software architect and uh, CEO of Log Sentinel. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Bojidar Bojanov. Did I manage to get the right clicker? No. So I, I fully agree that uh, all of the previous talks were indeed very inspiring, so I'll, I'll try to keep up to that level. Hopefully I'll succeed. Uh, so as I was presented, I was the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Bulgaria, uh, but I'm a software engineer of profession, and I write software, and I create software. And so I like to think that the devil is usually in the details, and software is usually the devil is in the details, uh, so hopefully the details are not too boring. Uh, so what is electronic voting to begin with? Uh, it actually can mean a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that it means is uh, remote voting, that's internet voting, that the ability to vote from your home, or from the train, or from anywhere you are, from your mobile phone, whatever. Uh, this is the, the definition and the thing that we are going to talk about today. The other thing is also electronic voting. We also call it machine voting. Uh, and it's about voting in a polling station on a particular machine that records your vote. It could be uh, various types of technologies, offline voting that then prints out receipts, online uh, sending data to servers, whatever. But these are the, the basically the two different ways to do electronic voting. And so 
Bulgaria had a referendum on electronic, remote electronic voting in 2015. And this slide doesn't capture all the, all the drama and all the details of how that happened and the effort of uh, a civil society organization, actually, and many of them. Uh, the most important one being uh, our first speaker today, Mr. Krustev, was part of that organization. And it helped a lot in getting the signatures, getting the, the campaign out there, uh, getting people actually to know what electronic voting is, what are the benefits and what are the risks. Uh, so the result was yes. The result was yes, but it was not uh, sufficient to actually make it mandatory. So there had to be a decision by parliament to, to make it into law, in effect. So we had two proposals by MPs uh, for legislation. They then later got merged. Now, of course, these slides, again, do not tell the whole story because uh, the, two, the, the merging process was a very heavy work in, in committees. Uh, the discussion were a three, three-day uh, discussion in uh, the legal committee in parliament. And they were mostly off topic. They were not about e-voting. They were about other things that MPs wanted to get into the uh, election code. And then we got to e-voting on the third day at 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, and it was passed just like that in committee and then, and then in, in the hall. Uh, I happened to be the co-author of one of the, of the options, of one of the MP proposals. Uh, and of course, I didn't get that out of, out of thin air. Uh, I previously studied the experience of many other countries, of, of many uh, research papers, and what is the, actually the state of the art. So I think that our current legislation uh, kind of embodies the, the best of the state of the art at the moment. Uh, so the, the law basically said in 2019, we should have binding electronic voting elections for European Parliament. Until then, there should be experiments. Uh, so. Why electronic voting? I mean, it sounds cool, okay, but why do we need that? Uh, and the first thing, that the most obvious thing, uh, Bulgaria and also other Balkan countries have huge diasporas outside of, of their homeland, uh, in Europe, in the United States, everywhere in the world. So we kind of want to include them as part of our decision-making body of, of people. Uh, but that is not the only reason. Uh, the, the other reason, and it's a set of reasons, have electronic voting is actually to look forward. And this is an, one additional future word uh, for today, for the, the person that, that counted them. Uh, so it, it's not location bound. You could vote from anywhere. And it is not actually uh, a thing that, that happens that could happen every four years. I mean, uh, one of the presenters yesterday on the hackathon very rightly mentioned that democracy is not about four year election cycles. You should be involved in democracy every day. And I think e-voting is a step to provide the ability to be involved in everyday decisions for, for citizens. And while we talk about participation, uh, we should, as governments, as uh, parliaments, allow citizens to actually participate in a more easy way, rather than making them go through multiple hoops to actually be able to participate. And e-voting is a mechanism, that the technology behind it is a mechanism to actually provide such a very usable and user-friendly way for, for real-time participation, basically, by citizens. Uh, it's not rocket science, but it's actually very hard to, to get it right. Uh, it is science. It's not just writing a few lines of code and it gets working. It's not a, a polling software that you write a few options, someone chooses, and then you're done. Uh, it's actually hard and you have to tackle a lot of issues. I've outlined a few and one of the obvious ones is the ballot secrecy. So how do you guarantee that the, the vote that a person casts is actually secret? Nobody can read it. Well, there are multiple ways to solve that with technology. Uh, the simplest one that could be very easily explained is the double envelope approach. It is actually used in paper voting, uh, in, in, in mail voting, regular mail voting. When you email, when you, sorry, <laughs> I'm using the email instead of mail because we today call the mail snail mail, so the terminology changes. So you mail your uh, vote in two envelopes. The inner envelope contains the vote, the outer envelope contains the, your name. So your identity is there, your vote is there, but when they open the, the envelopes, they split them. So they check that you have the right to vote, they have your vote and they can count it, 
but I can no longer associate the identity to the actual vote. And this is what happens with cryptographic means. Uh, it's actually more secure because uh, in, in the paper world, someone can open both envelopes and actually make the link, whereas in the technology world, this can be limited as an option. The other, the other main principle of actually voting is one man, one vote. Uh, here, it's actually one man, one counted vote, because as we'll see in the next slide, there is a, a slight uh, technical detail there. Uh, and also, there is the, the effect of coercion. So what uh, we, especially in, in not so uh, experienced democracies, uh, have vote buying, have uh, coercion, have controlled votes, and all other vote frauds. And these things happen, and how would uh, electronic voting affect that? Would it make it worse? If so, why and how? So a few main, main aspects uh, of, of how this implementation would be rolled out, and this is in our law now. Uh, there's an e-voting period. So you are supposed to vote a few days before the actual election day. Uh, so then there's the vote overriding, and this kind of tackles the coercion aspect because if someone has forced you to vote in a certain way, then you can go and change your vote. You can replace your first vote with the second vote and with the third vote if, if, if it has to be. Uh, now, you can do that also on election day with paper. So no matter how you voted electronically, if someone had taken, for example, your e-identity, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, you can go in the polling station and use the secrecy of the controlled environment of the, of the secret ballot box and your vote will be replaced. How that happens technically is a complicated story. And there is also another thing that's called verifiability. And this is a, an extension of the actual voting, paper voting process, because in the paper voting, you cannot get uh, a proof that your vote is actually stored and counted correctly. Well, in the electronic world, you can. Uh, there are multiple approaches to that, but you can actually get a proof that your vote is actually stored correctly without revealing your vote and without the ability to reveal the vote to someone who, for example, coerced you. Uh, the key to all of that is electronic identity. And Estonia, which has electronic identity for a long time, uh, and this is one of the reasons they have e-voting, uh, introduced it. And it is basically a very secure way to present yourself online, to identify yourself online to governments or other institutions uh, in a legally binding way. And it is based on the security of a smart card. This is this chip that we have on our, uh, actually, credit cards. It's the, the same kind of technology. It is the same technology we have in our mobile phones. The SIM card is similar and practically the same. Uh, and it's this card that is, I think, mandatory to, to ensure the, the secrecy of the vote. Because if someone else could have our password, our key, whatever, then they can cast a vote on our behalf and we wouldn't know. This smart card doesn't allow anything to escape from it. So it kind of guarantees that whoever owns the card is the one that casts the vote. So is it secure, would everyone would ask? Well, nothing is 100% secure. Paper voting is not 100% secure. Uh, the point is to reduce the risks and to make sure that no mass vote manipulation can happen. So nobody could go to the database and say, update all votes, set party equals the, the winning party, whatever. Uh, the good thing is that it, it has been done. It has been done in Estonia, it has been done in, in Switzerland, in some cantons, it has been done in France for people voting abroad. Uh, it has been done and it has succeeded. It, it's not rocket science, it's working out there in the wild. It is possible. Uh, but trust is the most important aspect because no matter how secure something is, if people don't trust it, it's as good as ins completely insecure. So you have to, to kind of tackle these two issues of security and trust at the same moment. So you have to be very, very careful when introducing the technology not to get something wrong, because once you get something wrong, then the trust is gone. And even if, if you fix it afterwards, then the trust is still gone. So the question is, will there be online voting in Bulgaria in 2019? Unfortunately, I don't want to be negative here, but it's unlikely at the moment, uh, because of several reasons. Uh, one of them is the delay of our new electronic identity. Uh, others are people who are trying to overstate the risks too much. Uh, there are some very uh, strange arguments that are wrong, but people are still using them. Uh, but I think in the end, even if it's not 2019, Bulgaria will, will have electronic vote. It is currently in the law. They might postpone that for a year or two. Uh, but in the end, we will have electronic voting, and it will not be because 
some politician decided, it will be because the people voted, because uh, there was a civil society organization that, that pushed that agenda. It's because we demanded it. It's because we dem demanded it in a very smart way. It's because we had the experts to actually, myself included, to actually write the legislation in a way that it's actually applicable. Uh, and I think we, we will be able to make it, even if it's not going to be next year. Thank you. Bonjida Bojanov.